Rub up your engines! John Flux says, who makes the best automatic transmission? I want to buy a new car and I don't want a CVT. Is a Toyota 8 speed okay? How about Mazda 6 speed? New Toyota 8 speed, as far as I've checked out, are perfectly fine. I haven't had any customers with problems with them. When I drove them, they drove perfectly fine. The earlier ones had more of a software issue. There was really nothing wrong with the transmissions. They didn't break and not work. People just kind of whined about how they shift. And of course, if you ever found out how complex an 8 speed transmission was with computers doing all kinds of adaptations as you drive. It's no surprise that they got to make the software upgraded until they get it perfect. But I haven't seen any problems with the new ones or heard any complaints. Now the Mazda 6 speed is also good because you know Toyota and Mazda now are working together and sharing their technology. Mazda is actually an up and coming manufacturer. They're actually getting better. So either one, I personally would go with the Toyota myself. Andrew Wells said, Scotty, I broke my wife's wiper linkage on her 07 Nissan Murano. Went to the dealer. They wanted 1300 bucks for the part. I bought it online for 133. How do I convince her not to buy another Nissan? Well, I don't know if you can convince your wife of anything, <laughs> but <laughs> Ever watch my videos about Toyotas, how they don't break down, how you don't have to spend money on them. And then, uh, as you found out, Nissan is a very disreputable company. When they have parts that they think you can only buy through them, they want all that money, $1,300. They don't realize there's an aftermarket for some of them. Now, sometimes for Nissan, there isn't. I've had it where I had to go to the dealer to buy a power steering pump assembly and a hose, and it might have cost $1,200. Where with a Toyota, I could get an aftermarket one for $300. So, there's a much better aftermarket for the Toyotas too when they finally do break. Parts are cheaper or easier to get than Nissan. So tell her that if she likes saving money. A. Lopez says, I got a 2015 Camaro, 98,000 miles. It pauses 10 seconds before it cranks to start. What's the problem? Here's how modern cars work. They're not like the old cars. The old cars, you had a battery. The power went from the battery to the ignition switch. You turned the key, the switch sent the power to the starter. Simple, right? Well, modern cars, when you turn the key to start the car, it doesn't send 12 volts to anything. It's a five volt reference signal, just like in your computers. And then it goes through computer signals and relays. And if it decides it's okay, you're in park, you got your foot on the brake, the computer will then send power to a relay and the relay will bump it up to 12 volts. And then that 12 volts goes to the starter and it starts to crank. Well, that system is breaking down on yours. First thing, have the battery load tested. Could be a weak battery, you know, you never know. If not, it's often the ignition switch assembly starting to go bad that'll do something like that. It's getting weak and it takes a while to send the power. The only other thing is your starter could be starting to go out. So what you want to do is when it's having a problem, quick open the hood, beat the starter with a big stick or a piece of metal where the key is held in the starting position. And as soon as you hit it, clunk, it starts. That means that the starter itself is starting to go out because it's a six year old Chevy and a lot of times the starters wear out that early. Rosie 88 says, I got a question. When your car's check engine light is flashing, the car's shaking, what should it be? All right, well, here's the thing. Could be a billion different things. There's dozens of things that it could actually be. When your check engine light comes on and it just comes on and isn't flashing, tells you there's a trouble code stored. And if a car runs okay, it's usually not that big of a deal. If it starts flashing while you're driving it, that means that you got a serious problem enough to eventually destroy the catalytic converter. It's a legal thing. They have to flash and they don't run right. There could be a lot of things, bad ignition coil, bad fuel injector, all kinds of things. There's all kinds of possibilities. But go anywhere. Any auto parts store will scan it free, get scanned, get the code. And they can tell you. And if you get confused, you can go to my website, scottykilmer.com. Say, Scotty, I've got this code on my car. What does it mean? And I'll explain it to you. But you got to get the code because otherwise there's scores of things it could be. You don't want to guess. Tim P. If you have generators on wheels, you should not have to plug in electric cars for charging. Okay. <laughs> You've got an interesting theory, but unfortunately in practice, that doesn't work because the laws of physics, you can't get something for nothing. Now, if you have a car and the wheels have generators on them, but it's an electric car, right? The electric motor has to power the wheels to make them spin, right? Well, you're using the motor to spin the wheels, but then you're using the wheels to create electricity. That will take all the power used to drive the wheel to recreate electricity and it won't go anywhere. You have a net result of zero power. You always have to get power from somewhere. That's where it's a scam where those people say, oh, I have water H2O generators and I generate hydrogen and burn it in my car. Well, 
Yeah, you can generate electricity and electrolysis. You can make hydrogen and oxygen out of water, but it takes so much energy to do that. It takes more energy to break apart the hydrogen and oxygen from water than you ever did burning the hydrogen. And in effect, it's a net loss process. You would have to use more energy from your engine to create the electricity to make the hydrogen through electrolysis than you ever get by burning the hydrogen. So don't ever get suckered into people that say, oh, water generators, I run my car on it. That's a bunch of nonsense, too. Gavin Bennett says, I want a car that runs on marijuana. All right, well, I don't think you would because if you did, it would just sit there in a stupor and not go anywhere and watch TV all day long. <laughs> Now, I guess if you got it and burned it, you could get a steam car and you could use that to create the steam to run the steam engine. <laughs> it would be legal in Canada, I guess. They legalize it in the whole country. Who knows what people will try? John Smith says, Scotty, I only drive three miles to work every day. Would it be wise to drive my 2017 Tacoma in the sports mode instead of drive to keep the rubs up and get engine to run better? Yeah, that's a very good idea. I've had customers that I even told them that they would say, you know, I never get over 30 miles an hour in my car. And I say, what's going to carbon up inside? So what they tell them is leave it in first gear for a while, first and second gear, put it in one or two instead of putting it in drive. And then when you're going 30, the engine's going faster and it'll help burn the carbon out. The worst thing for an engine is to lag. So if you're always driving so that the tachometer is like 1,000, 1,200 RPM, yeah, you're going to get good gas mileage for a while, but the engine's going to build up with carbon. They're made to run at a little bit higher RPMs. And that's a very good idea if you don't drive that far. And then of course, whenever you go someplace, take it on a highway, the speed limit's 70, drive 70 for an hour, and it'll help clean it out too. Eugene Jr. Folsey says, Scotty, how do you clean the injectors on a gasoline direct injection. The pressure in the cylinders would make the normal methods not work. Here's the problem. Those injectors themselves, some of them run at 1,500 pounds per square inch pressure, and gasoline is actually a very good solvent cleaner. So just using good gasoline, those injectors themselves generally keep whistle clean. But the problem with the GDI engine is they inject the gasoline right into the engine cylinders. The old ones injected the gas on the intake manifold fold so when your intake valves open they'd suck the gasoline over the intake valves which kept the intake valves clean a gdi engine doesn't do that so the gdi engines their valves just suck in air and unfortunately the pcv valve system gets oil and oil vapor and it sucks it in and it oil and oil vapor actually carbons up the intake valves which the gasoline used to clean but it doesn't in a gdi engine to clean those you basically have to pay a mechanic like myself with a very fancy cleaning machine that we inject the cleaner on the intake and the good ones the ones that are made in Albuquerque New Mexico they take about an hour and they run by computer and they use different types of solvents in different cans it takes about an hour for the whole process and it actually will clean most of the carbon off of them. but you can't do it by adding a gas in a gas tank because if you did it sprays in the injectors which is directly into the cylinders and it bypasses the intake valves so they never get cleaned it has to be sprayed in with a professional machine. The rocket said, Scotty, what's the worst outboard motor for a boat in your opinion? Well, any of those cheaply made Chinese ones, they're pretty terrible, you know. They made some knockoff ones that were absolutely horrendous. The American ones, Avonrude, Mercury, those are, you know, they make good engines. And of course, Honda makes killer ones. They make four-stroke outboard motor. Honda makes the best motors in the world for all kinds of stuff. Boats too now. But those cheaply made Chinese ones, they were absolute junk. I mean, they would just fall apart because they were too cheaply made. And outboard motors, they just generally rev at higher speeds because, you know, propellers aren't that efficient at pushing a boat. You got this little B propeller, it's got to spin like mad. So they're always at higher RPMs and higher RPMs and cheap metal don't go together. They fall apart a lot earlier. Off the line says, Morning Scotty, is a 1999 2.2 Chevy Automatic Cavalier Reliable. Got it for 750 bucks with 223,000 kilometers. It's still rolling with 238,000. Okay, well, you must be in Canada. 750 bucks for a car in Canada where they cost a lot more is like $400 here and you've been driving it and it still runs. What the heck? They're not known as the most reliable cars in the world, but you're talking about kilometers. So 220,000 kilometers is like, what, 120,000 miles. So it could still have some life and you didn't pay much for it. You know, don't expect miracles, but change the oil. Don't overheat the engine. Keep air in the tires. Who knows how long it'll last? You know, you didn't pay much for it. So, I mean, the other day I was looking at renting a car at an airport and for three days they wanted 500 bucks. So... <laughs> 
You got a whole car and you're still driving around. What the heck? Rashid and he says, Scotty, I have a Chrysler 3.6 V6 Pentastar engine you reviewed. It's got 150,000 miles. Do you recommend changing the oil pump to maintain longevity? Yes, in that particular design, I would. I would change the oil pump. Why tempt fates? They're known to go bad when they get older. So, what the heck? Have the pump replaced. It's not that big of a deal. And you'll ensure that it won't break for quite some time. It's a good insurance policy. So if you never want to miss another one of my new car repair videos, remember to ring that bell.